Celtics Beat is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. What's up, everyone? Welcome to a new edition of Celtics Beat. Great to have you here with us on Easter Sunday, as a matter of fact. I know some of us need to put in the hard work on Easter Sunday. We can't just be lounging around, getting ready for Elite Eight games and you know, day baseball and afternoon basketball and, and draft prep in the NFL. No, we got to put in the hard work here and record a Celtics theme podcast, which, uh, yeah, obviously there's nothing hard about this. We enjoy every second of it. Adam Kaufman, M. Valenti, and we have Sam Packard on the show for, I don't know if it's the first time ever, but it's definitely the first time when I've been hosting. So Sam and I get in a chat here for the first time, which is great from, uh, of course, the still potable podcast, which many of you I'm sure out there know, Sam first welcome. But second, uh, I think uh, I have to, how many incarnations of this podcast have there been going back through the years? I mean, it was way back with like you, Jay King, Corrales, the locked on obviously, but then, you know, with the athletic and now you're part of the CLNS family and B Rob and, and just, I mean, this, this podcast has in, in one version or another been around for a while. Yeah. Well, it's great to be here and I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, I think this is version 4.0 uh, <laughs> started way back on locked on uh, Jay and John were doing a podcast and then they were going to daily. And so they invited me on. I, of course, got to change my name to Jam there. And so, you know, that was uh, fun. Um, really, just it's the athletic that has been uh, the main driver of all the changes because then they said uh, Jay had to do his own podcast. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll join the athletic because I like clout and clout's fun. And then so <laughs> Jay and I started Anything is Potable. Uh, and then the athletic's like, oh, we don't do team podcasts anymore. And so uh, we had to kind of, figure things out and that went to still potable which we had for about two weeks and then b-rob was like hey i could uh do a podcast and so we brought in b-rob for another daily celtics podcast over on the patreon so it's been four different versions but it's basically the same level of uh hopefully nonsense slash analysis that we uh we like to bring to talking about the celtics yeah, and obviously uh, listeners of or, or fans of the Celtics, listeners of this podcast, I'm sure also listeners, viewers of that podcast. Saw you guys had Zach Lowe on recently, which, you know, is, uh, you know, always a fun one. He goes way back to like the Celtics blog days with B-Rob and everything. So uh, he's, you know, of, of the many Celtics blog people to uh, truly take off. Actually, he wasn't he wasn't Celtics blog, right? He was the one with. He was a Celtics uh, hub. Celtics uh, hub. That was the one that B Rob started. That's right. Way back in the in the day. Yeah, like there, ESPN. There's a had lot the... of Celtics coverage, man. Oh, have you noticed? Uh, there, this was, there's many, many Celtics uh, podcasts. Is it, is it watered down? Is it oversaturated yet? Oh, I think I like to think the cream rises to the top, but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> we're we're hoping, man. Savage. Yeah. So uh, let's let's talk through a little bit of what's what's happening. So the. The last time, Ev, I, I think that we had a show, I don't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday or Friday or whatever the hell day last week with Greeny from uh, Barstool, of course, we were talking about this team. I think maybe it was an eight-game winning streak at the time. They won nine in a row, and then they dropped that back-to-back -back in Atlanta, which was not a back-to-back -back because it was a Monday-Thursday situation with the Hawks having a game in between, but a back-to-back, -back, I guess, for the Celtics, and they were both in Atlanta but that weird gap and just everything was was disoriented and the the Celtics it was anything but inspiring their performances they lost both those games they bounced back you know one last time out against the Pelicans uh and that was a uh even a little slow at points you'll sluggish out of the gate they rally late get a lead at halftime and cruised in the second half that was yesterday as we sit here right now and uh I, I just the discourse around this team, and and you guys know this, it's a group that is still, to date, and this was the case when we talked last week, it is still the only team that has clinched a playoff spot. They have, you know, run away, obviously, with the Eastern Conference. They're closing in, hopefully, on 60-20. They're 58-16 and 16 right now, 60-20 being 60 losses, or 60 wins, 20 losses. Hopefully, get to that 60 wins before the 20. Maybe we don't see 20 losses at all as the regular season winds down. That would be wonderful. This team is... You know, at least regular season wise, definitely exceeding the expectations I had for them. And yet, 
we sit here at the very end of March and things aren't perfect guys. I know they're generally healthy. That is the most important thing. They're sort of strategically load managing these guys, getting themselves ready for the playoffs. No problem with that at all. The biggest concern is late game execution. And we saw it in both those games with Atlanta. We've seen it at other stretches during the year, even games that they've won the just uninspiring uncreative borderline lazy iso to tatum at the end of games is increasingly frustrating when you have so many guys say i'm on this team that are capable of helping you win a game late there have been conversations at higher levels than us that we brought up two months ago about how we'd rather see Jalen Brown with the ball at the end of the game, just statistically speaking, it's it's been better than Tatum. Doesn't mean Brown's a better player than Tatum, just means at the end of the game, Brown has been a better player in those final moments than Tatum has been. Why do we have to just default and have the 37,000 dribbles and off-balance ugly shot to try and win a game, but that's where we're at. Let's start there. How much of that is on Tatum versus obviously Joe Mazzulla and the coaching staff for not imploring them to do something different. I, I think you got to blame everyone involved. I mean, it, it's the process has been bad. I think we saw at the end of the first Hawks game, it was Jalen Brown dribbling the hell out of the basketball. And that really didn't result in a great shot either. And so at what point are they going to try anything different than that i think that's my biggest takeaway is that like we've seen just kind of the iso doesn't really work doesn't produce a good shot it's either just a, a fadeaway jumper and so and i think they did some of that the the second game against the hawks was interesting because the end of regulation it's tied and they just ran the same bad tatum play and then actually in overtime we saw them inbound to Chris Taps. They had Tatum cuts. He finds Jalen Brown, who knocks down a jumper. We saw, uh, I think, a t- uh, Jalen. It was more. It was somewhat of an ISO, but it also involved Tatum or and Derek White running some like a back screen. And so that's all I want is just something other than just the the one isolation play. I don't think Joe is on the sideline being like, hold the ball for 20 seconds. <laughs> I think <laughs> I don't think that's the play he's calling out. And so I do think it's like eventually on the players to do something different, whether that it's just like, hey, in, involve Derek White. He is likely going to have the smallest guy on the team. He's very good at setting screens. Just do something different. And I think it's ultimately on the players to kind of, uh, implement something because they it's clearly as much as they believe in themselves they're all they're all both Jalen and Jason are extremely confident players it's just not what gets them good looks uh, for the first 47 minutes of a game and so at some point that it has to translate to oh maybe we should maybe we should try something a little different yeah, and with Derek, it's like he's kind of one of their best clutch time shooters. I'm trying to currently figure out, um, you know, as we're talking here, what his clutch time uh, shooting percentage is. But he's clearly one of the best. You know, he has some of the best fourth quarter numbers in the league this year, especially for the Celtics. And I keep going back to just what everybody says about Derek in terms of he always makes the right – like Chris Stapps months ago on the J.J. Redick podcast was like, I almost like get – a little frustrated when Derek doesn't do the right play because he's always 95% of the time always making the right decision and every once in a while like he doesn't and I kind of sit there and question it um he just has good control of the basketball game and it's kind of like if you go all the way back to the, something that we've been talking about and by we I mean everybody in the Celtics NBA you know uh, conversation you know, they need a, a real point guard to slow things down at the end of the game. So they have one. He's sitting right there. His name's Derek White. He can control everything. It's one of these things where you have to trust your teammates. And I don't know if Boston – like, I think they're very capable of having end-of-game situations that go very well. But it's just a matter of, like, do they trust everybody or not when it when it really matters. You can t- – and, again, we always compare them to Denver because that's who you're chasing. Uh, or you're, you're chasing Golden State, you know, like a, the, the ghost of Golden State past of teams that always make the right decision at the right time. Steph Curry trusting his teammates to know if everything breaks down, just give me the ball and I'll figure it out. 
And I'm not quite sure if Tatum has that faith in his teammates like that quite yet. Everybody knows Jokic is going to make the right decision no matter what happens at the end of the basketball game. He's brilliant. He's he's the Terminator, like, on offense. I've never seen anything quite like it. Tatum, I don't think, has that level of trust in his guys yet. And I think it's going to take the playoffs for him to really realize that. Um, and that's the final form. Like, that's it. Like, we've been talking. We are at game, what, 70-whatever, 60-whatever. That's the last thing they have to accomplish is that one thing. And we keep hammering this. And, and we've talked about Zach Lowe being on your podcast recently, Sam. This is something that that Lowe has been talking about all season. It's the only thing that was really left for the Celtics to, to hurdle. And once that happens, you know, it's, it's going to be really tough for the rest of the league to catch up. Denver is one of the few teams that can. So it's we've been agonizing this for months about this particular one thing. And it's not just months, it's years. But that's it. That's all we have to talk about. It's that and health. And it's I know it's annoying for a lot of people, Coffin, that we talk about this every single week. But that's it. I mean, we can sit here and talk about, oh, they're going to match up against X, Y, or Z, but we don't know yet. We have no idea. It hasn't fully shaken out yet. That bottom half of the yeah. East is really interesting. Like, it's just a lot of jockeying for position. So all we can really do is focus on what the Celtics are currently doing. And that's it. Because most of the time, they shoot the hell out of it. They play great defense. They're pretty healthy right now. That's it. That's all we have to do. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's a tournament season or the fight for a playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Testing my skills on prize picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Prize picks is really simple to play, and I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Use the code CLNS for the first deposit match up to a hundred dollars pick more pick less it's that easy i mean i think the, the larger point and and you alluded to this ev is 74 games in at this point there's less than 10 left in the regular season and yeah we could sit here on a weekly weekly basis and say oh my god they're the only team that's clinched a playoff spot and how amazing is this and they have the best record by far in the nba and good luck catching them get the duck boats ready. Here comes banner 18 and all like we could be, you know, pro 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 like over the top about it. And, and that I'm sure is what some listeners viewers out there on the CLNS YouTube page want. And, and no, like I'm, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I, I tweeted, I don't remember exactly what I tweeted, but after that second Atlanta loss, I tweeted something to the effect of what, you know, and, inexcusable borderline unacceptable loss it was and you know 16 point favorites or something like that going into that game and you know forget like covering they lost outright the game before that they were up by 30 points and again forget didn't cover 10 and a half they lost the game outright and fine like those I want to say those games happen. They really don't. I mean, in the, in today's NBA, you know, it's not like back in the day, like back in the nineties, we're growing, you know, giving up a, a 15 point lead was a big deal. I realize that's not where we are today. You know, teams on a nightly basis, give up 20 point leads. That happens. I understand it. Not 30 point leads, 30 point leads. Generally speaking, you win that game. And you know, the Celtics, obviously, lose it you know the even the pelicans game they're up 22 gets down to 12 that's not like i won't call that blowing it it just got a little tighter than than they would have liked but you know that second game in atlanta guys i thought that was especially because they were fully healthy i thought that was going to be guns blazing step on their throats react to how pissed they were from what happened back on monday kind of performance and we didn't get that and fine coming off of that like now you're against new orleans like you're gonna come out and just curb stomp the pelicans and out of the shoot they're down and it takes a, a miracle Derek white shot to even be up at halftime and i know like they generally cruise from there but 
for all the people in my mentions, and I'm sure you guys get the same stuff that, you know, we'll say something about one of these games and what a disappointing loss. And the conversation is, dude, who cares? Like they've got 58 wins. They've, you know, locked up the East. These games are meaningless. Let's get to the playoffs. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, I get that seating is not relevant and these games don't matter, but habit building, they do matter. And, and the way that execution looks at the end of games, it does matter because you're not going to flip a switch. How many times have we seen this in, in the last decade and a half of Celtics playoff basketball, where people seem to think the playoffs are going to come and something is going to happen in the playoffs that didn't happen during the regular season. It's not the way it works. You know, the, these are your, your, this is the breeding ground for what the end the playoffs are going to look like and and what these clutch time situations are going to look like and how they're going to manage these games. You're going to tell me in a game six against Philadelphia in the second round and the Celtics are, you know, tied and, and you need a, a, a bucket to win the game and win the series. It's not going to be ISO to Tatum with no creativity, no look to pass. No, of course it is. That's exactly what it's going to look like. And he's going to hit it and people are going to celebrate or he's going to miss it and people are going to bitch. And that's the way it goes. I think all of this that we're starting to see, or not starting, continuing to see, is really indicative of what is to come. And that doesn't mean they're not going to win the whole thing. It doesn't mean they can't win the whole thing. It doesn't mean they're a bad team, Sam, or anything like that. But I just, I, I balk at the notion that what we're seeing right now, what we saw in Atlanta, that none of this counts, that none of this matters at all. I think it's a stupid social media narrative or anybody else out there that's that's spewing it. Yeah, I think one of the things that's been interesting about the Celtics this year is that they, uh, at least earlier in the season, they felt like they did a much better job of responding to down games or even just responding in situations, not letting games get away from them. They've absolutely destroyed like the kind of the worst teams in the league. Maybe they don't respect the Atlanta Hawks whatsoever. I probably don't respect Quinn Snyder when he's wearing those goofy red uh, framed glasses, but they've done a very good job of responding to um, kind of lulls and effort and energy. And I think that's one of the things that made the, the, at least the second game in Atlanta disappointing. I actually thought um, we talk a lot about the, the clutch offense. I thought their defense in the second game um, was pretty bad. I thought, I think Chris Stapps Porzingis was a great uh, at the rim. I don't think he brought it uh, defensively. That's a reason why they're giving up so many offensive rebounds, which allowed the Hawks to stay in that game. I think they did a much better job of locking in against the Pelicans. Um, we saw Chris Stapps kind of challenge Zion, or Zion challenge Chris Stapps at the rim multiple times, and I thought Chris Stapps did a better job of just being that rim protector and, and bringing more intensity on defense. I also think Jalen Brown deserves a lot of credit for like picking up Zion. Like I just didn't know that was just looking at their two body sizes, that that was something that Jalen Brown could reasonably do. And I think really it's about bringing that intensity on, on the defensive end, because that's like one of the, you're giving up 30 point lead to the Hawks. You're giving up a 30 point lead to the Cavs. A lot of that is defensive failures. And if you get, they got a couple stops in that game and brought the intensity in that we wouldn't necessarily be talking about their clutch offense. And so I do think they did a better job uh, against the Pelicans of just bringing that intensity on defense. They have this phenomenal talent, uh, one through six, in terms of being able to um, lock in defensively. And I thought they did a much better job in that Pelicans game. And it, it, it all started with Jalen Brown. And it's kind of insane to say on a roster that has Derek White, on a roster that has Drew Holiday, but it feels like Jalen Brown is like the defensive leader on this team, the guy willing to pick up the other team's best player. And we've all watched Jalen Brown for his entire career. This guy got lost. Like anytime Jalen Brown was defending off ball, there was a guy cutting back uh, behind him for a layup. And so I think he deserves a lot of credit for just his growth as a player to be able to be like, you know what? Damian Lillard's in town. I'm going to guard Dame. Uh, we're playing against the Pelicans. I'm going to guard Zion. Like that kind of versatility from a guy who's not really was not known as a defender. I think hopefully will um, trickle down to the rest of the team when you see your all NBA level uh, guard or forward willing to step up and play that intensely on defense. 
hopefully that will trickle down to um, the rest of the team so they don't have these kind of lapses where um, they're leaving it to the final 30 seconds, and then we have to have this whole kind of ISO discussion. Well, go back to that Atlanta game, the second one at the end of the game. You know, they, it was a lot of DeJounte Murray calls up whoever's – uh, Chris Stapp's working this assignment. They switched Chris Stapp's on DeJounte. We all know how that went, except for the second to last possession where DeJounte decided to go straight at Jalen Brown and Jalen was not having any of that. Stopped him, got a turnover, came back down the other end, hit the game tying shot at the time. And he noticed DeJounte Murray didn't go at Jalen Brown for the game winner. <laughs> There's a reason for that. And it's because Jalen's been outrageous defensively this year. And I want to make that point because it's a great, I want to echo that a little bit because it's a great point he brought up. It's not just Jalen either. Um, Jason at times has done this where he's like, like the Shea Gilgis Alexander game where he was going nuts against the Celtics in Oklahoma city. And Tatum was like, all right, enough of this. I'm, I'm just going to take him." And, and really frustrated Shea for the last quarter of that game. When your best players can, can say, you know what? I, and this is the thing that showed me a lot of maturity of the Celtics this year, which, which is why I have some hope for like, the way the playoffs go, because Coffin, we talked about developing good habits. Now, yes, mm-hmm. they have a little room left here to, to develop some good habits, but they've also done a good job of that for the previous 70 games. Like they've, they're, it's like they're, they've won 58 games. It's not like they don't have good habits. Um, but like some of the things that they've done defensively to take guys out of structure, right? Like whether it's Jalen or Jason or, Drew Holiday's playing this weird, just free safety thing, moving around. It just, to Sam's point, it takes just a little bit of, like, intensity to lock in a little bit. And, yeah, I understand most of these games at the end of the year, they don't really matter at all. And at the, at, to be frankly honest with both of you, I'm very pro, I'm very team. Just as long as nobody gets hurt, I really don't care what happens during these games. The I, the last week with – with um, with Greeny Kaufman, we had the, we have to push this back because we don't know everything about Drew Holiday's injury yet. Right. We were talking about that right off the top of the show. Drew has a dead dead arm, arm. not dead arm. Yeah. It's not a dead arm. Don't you dare say it was a dead arm, even though that's what he told Adam Himmelsbach. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh that, that scared everybody for a little bit. He seems to be okay. Okay. Flirted with a triple double yesterday. Yeah. He seems to be fine. But like at at the end of the day, yes, you want to see them, locking defensively you want to see them do x y and z but as we go from here the end of the season all i care about is that that injury sheet is clean uh and you're gonna see like whatever weird injuries they want to make up for certain guys when they want to rest them sure fine if it's an injury i've never heard of before that i'm probably gonna be okay but from here on out just looking for that clean injury sheet just making sure everybody's cool um and, and 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 that's it but like yeah there are certain things we can still nitpick as, as we get going here but i do want to point out that the defensive stuff from some of the leaders in this team this season has been really eye-opening and jalen just because as sam said he wasn't the greatest defender we all knew we had it in him this year we're seeing it. max wins 66 for this team in the regular season and uh of these eight games left of course you got your monday night in charlotte we know jason tatum is playing in that one and then uh after that it's you know you get six out of the final seven at home so this team is uh, obviously positioned well to win a whole hell of a lot of games taking them into the playoffs there'll be more and more rest down the stretch inevitably celtics aren't concerned in any way shape or form about seeding all of that is locked up so they're just trying to stay as fresh as possible and to ev's point sam is there anything i feel like we bring this up to some degree every show at this point but is there anything that that does matter is there anything that matters the rest of the regular season outside of entering the playoffs at full health i i it's hard for me to come up with situations like maybe they can play themselves into six clutch games and so they can really try and work on some things down the stretch like really do their <laughs> best like i don't know what are the crazy things about that first atlanta that's game? why they like, keep blowing all these leads guy we're up we're up too much let them come back we got to work on some stuff or what other reason would there be to play Jaden springer for eight minutes in the fourth quarter of that first hawks game like you that was my trying. point the entire next day i'm like Jaden springer <laughs> and Svi are getting fourth quarter minutes everybody relax here i was actually shocked to see that the team was like f- 
fully healthy against the Pelicans. Maybe it's because they lost both games in Atlanta that they like wanted to come out and right the ship. But I kind of fully expected them to be like three guys on, three guys off for the the rest of the season. I think it's just the 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 thing that's important is Willie like showing up and bring, like uh, having that defensive intensity for the rest of the game. Joe Missoula this year has been like very much focused on process. Uh, he is like truly a, a Brad Stevens disciple of like process over results. And so I do think there's a tendency, especially once they clinch the East to kind of overlook the Hawks. But I, I do think one of the strengths of this team is that they have not really done that this year. And so I think it's finishing out the, the season um, strong uh, and not really taking completely taking nights off. Um, I don't know. They have some interesting games. Like it's going to be fun to see how they play against the thunder. I mean, the thunder are one of the teams that beat them. Shea really like cut their defense apart. And so I think it's just going to be interesting to see how they play against. I think that's the most interesting matchup they have left. They play have a game against the bucks. I would imagine they don't play anyone because they don't want to reveal anything to them. They have a game against the Knicks, but that's against the front end of a back to back. So I imagine half the guys won't play. So I feel like, it's the thunder game will be the last interesting game. And then the rest is just like, let's see what's what's Lee, what Svi can do. I want to see Svi drop 20 points. Like that's, that's the most important thing for me for the remainder of the season. Oh, that that's Sunday, April 14th against the wizards, that final game. I mean, that could be, that's just a straight main call up game right there. That's all it is. Jordan Walsh, Davis double, double 40 minutes. <laughs> Use your prize picks code CLNS. Get all the Jordan Walsh overs on that day. That's right. Yeah, we could. Oh, there's this whole scandal we could help. Just be like, hey, Jordan, just say you're sick like three minutes into the game and call yourself out. So we just bet all the unders on your props. That's worth uh, destroying your NBA career over. Yeah, no, no big deal or anything. But I mean, yeah, it's it's just about like because one thing I liked about I liked, but I I liked that there was a, at least a, an excuse for it at the end of that first Hawks game. You know, they asked Missoula like. Why didn't you do anything to help Chris Stapps one on one with Dejounte or the second one uh, with Dejounte Murray? He's like, well, Chris Stapps during the playoffs is going to have to do that sometimes, and he has to be uh, at least up to date a little bit on how to guard his you know guard his yard and space against a smaller guy because you know there's going to be times in the playoffs where that's going to happen. He's going to be comfortable with it. The more reps he gets, the more comfortable he gets. Like obviously in the playoffs, they wouldn't let they wouldn't let the, they would let Dejounte Murray shoot it forty four times. Like they would send a double. Like that's that's why I think people get a little lost in the in the sauce a little bit. It's like obviously they're trying to, to do some stuff. Like that's the one thing I like about Joe this year. He's been he's been doing some stuff. He's been trying some things. I've been waiting for the two 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 one trap that they rolled out. The beginning of the year, we haven't really seen it since they tried oh, because it. that that stunk. It didn't work. <laughs> at well, no point did it work, except for the weird possessions where Drew Holiday just decided I'm doing whatever I want. Yeah, I would want him to see them try to do a different zone. Like, yeah. I feel like like anything different, but uh, that two 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 one two was always kind of a kind of a nightmare because it didn't really feel like anyone other than Drew Holiday knew what was going on. I think this may be by design, but like you know, just like. <laughs> Just try some stuff. Like I remember, again, they 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 would, they would do like full court pressing against the Wizards, like back in like November and December. And I was like, I love this. This is great. They're up like thirty five. They're just trying stuff because they don't get practice time. This is great. I would almost kind of treat some of these games like that. Like okay, let's because Joe talked about it. You know, the having the curveball thing. Like you know, maybe this is part of how we develop that curveball, or maybe they don't even want to show it now. Maybe it's like, well, yeah, that's buried in our tape back in. November, December, nobody's thinking that we can do this because we haven't shown it in a while and they'll just forget. So maybe that's what they're playing. I, I don't know. I Again, at the end of the day, it's all about health and that's the only thing I care about from here on out. And that's as, it. as much as I loathe Nick Nurse uh, for being a whiny crybaby, I will give him credit for he always had his Raptors team. It's like he could throw out seven different zones at any point because they worked on them in the regular season. And so I do... I don't know if it's too late to do that, but I do like think of like having that curveball, having that something to change the defense because, and I think they have that with Chris Tapps this year because he plays in a drop and then you can put in a Horford perhaps and switch everything. In past years, they're basically their entire defense was just like, we're going to switch. Maybe we'll try to hide Rob, but it feels like they were one dimensional. And I do think they have kind of the versatility now. 
again, coming back to Jalen's defense, uh, or it's like you can throw him on any number of different players. You can kind of switch everyone onto uh, different players where they can do something a little bit different, um, which hopefully will help them moving forward in the postseason. I do think of what you brought up before with respect to Porzingis and Missoula talking about it after the game is notable, is important. It, you know, the fact, obviously, that they're working on some of those different things. And, I, and look, bigger picture, I'll sacrifice a regular season game against the Hawks if it means them working on something that they may need in the playoffs and games that actually matter. That's fine. It's just, it is helpful, you know, to someone who's not as certainly basketball savvy as, as anybody on that coaching staff, you know, to, to hear some of that post game and Missoula is, you know, refreshingly um, honest a, a lot of the time in terms of some of the things that they are exploring or wanting to work on. And so it's, it is uh, nice when he is revealing in that way. I, I want as a consumer, as a fan, I want to hear some of that stuff. Sure. You know, my, my tweets, or level of anger after a game may be uh, somewhat motivated by how much money I had on the outcome. But I, I, I would like to see, obviously, some of these things in the bigger picture to get them as close as possible to Banner 18. We all want to see it. They're obviously built for it. They're as talented, if not more so, than anybody else, as deep as anybody else. We've talked about it here on this show, Sam, at, at nauseum probably. But what I'm sure you guys have gone in depth on Still Potable you know, you, JB, Rob, talking about the uh, just level of competition. You know, I think we all believe that, yeah, there are teams that, that are capable of tripping up the Celtics in the Eastern Conference, but this really should be viewed as as the seas to lose. I mean, this they are the best team in the East if they are healthy. But over in the West, if we get that, what some people feel is inevitable, that that finals matchup between Boston and Denver, I'm still at the camp that, and this isn't one of those, like the, the nuggets of the champs until somebody says otherwise, like you got to beat them. You got to show me it's, it's not that so much as when I watch the nuggets, which I do a fair amount, including against Boston, Jokic's the best player on the planet. And I just believe that they still are the best team. I, I think that is, you know, I, I think the Celtics sure could beat the nuggets, but and and, and betting-wise, would be the favorites to beat the Nuggets. But I don't think they should be. I think the Nuggets, the defending champs, should be the favorites in a potential series like that. How, how do you handicap that series as you look at it right now? I, I agree with you. The Nuggets are so good. Jokic is so good. Jokic, Murray, pick and roll, there's just not a real an answer for it. It feels like Aaron Gordon hanging out in the dunker spot is just like he's perfected that. I do think the the Celtics have a chance, but it, it, a lot of it comes down to can they have four games of like over forty percent three point shooting? Like this is like the the dumbest analysis you can have, but they you got to outscore the Nuggets if you want to beat them. But like you like they really have to have a um, and Joe Mazzulla talks about the math the entire time. They have to have an elite three point shooting uh, performance against the Nuggets across an entire series. Because the Nuggets, for how good they are on offense, they are and they're great at executing. They're not a great three-point shooting team, and so if you can kind of tilt the math in your favor and get four games where you're making fifteen to twenty threes, I think the Celtics have a chance. But Jokic, I mean, Jokic is just amazing. Like he's the best passer for a man that size I've ever seen, and so I think it would be a great series. I think the Celtics would be like I don't. I think it would be absolutely close, but I. I I'm with you. I would probably still favor the Nuggets uh, just because I haven't really seen anyone stop them in the playoffs yet when they're yeah, fully healthy. I, I said this in a in a group text the other day, but if the Celtics team can't beat the Nuggets, then the NBA has a serious problem. Because it's like if if this team of ridiculous talent can't take down Jokic, then I don't know. It's basically like can. Yeah. It's like hope the thunder figure everything out because they have a kajillion picks and a lot of young talent and maybe they can do it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot again, if if the Celtics were not to win the series, I don't have a lot of faith in Giannis going in there and, and doing it and faring any better. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's they're a they're a, a machine. They are a machine. And to Sam's credit, you're gonna have to just outscore them 
and it sounds simple, but it's really not because they're an excellent defensive team, you know, with, with KCP being just an incredible guy on both sides, sides, but like super good shooter, awesome defender, very versatile. Um, it really comes down to their bench. Like it is all about the non Jokic minutes because they always win the Jokic minutes. And if you go back to the two games that Boston has played against Denver, their bench has done a good job. And that's, what's frustrating is it's like if you're going to beat that team you have to hope the christian browns the world uh and the other guys that bring off the bench are just not having it you know they're young but they they have a lot of experience you know what i'm saying it's like one of these things where you know they've been to the finals most of the guys came back they've added some younger pieces like don't get me wrong but they just I don't know. It's going to be really tough if they get there, but you know, anything can really happen. It's just Jokic is the Terminator, man. He's just, he's the T-1000. I don't know if you want to keep going in this analogy. He's whatever the, what, what's her face from Terminator three, like the, the T-1 million or whatever she is. <laughs> like I, I, he's insane. He is insane. And uh, you know, I just want everybody to be healthy. Cause I don't want to do the, you know, Oh, Jokic was hurt. So that's, that's, I don't need that. I don't want that. That's for sure. Well, as we wrap up this show, the Celtics have uh, three games before prob- – I, I don't know. Maybe we'll come at you with a midweek show. We'll see. But if we stick with the weekend thing, they have three games before we talk to you again, which which is uh, at Charlotte Monday and then home against the Thunder and the Kings Wednesday, Friday. So in every other day situation, uh, pretty much the rest of the way, with the exception of that back-to-back with the Knicks and Hornets as uh, – Sam had mentioned before this Monday in Charlotte thing, by the way, like the, everybody remembers, that's why I made reference to it earlier. Everybody remembers the Jason Tatum thing about, you know, load management and wanting to play. And there's going to be that, that kid that shows up on a Monday night in Charlotte. This was something he said, what, back in the off season yeah. or at the end of last year, whatever it was. And and I don't want to miss that game. I, it's the only opportunity for that kid to see me and all that's so a, a very, I, I like it. I love when Tatum talks about that stuff, and I like that he he really needs to be forced out of games. It's a it's a rare superstar quality these days, and one that that obviously a big fan of. But the whole Monday in Charlotte thing, the Celtics go to Charlotte two times this year. They already been once, then obviously this one. Both times a Monday night in Charlotte. That can't be an accident, right? <laughs> like that's like there, there's 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 no way that's a coincidence. That's just the NBA being the NBA where this like cutesy cheeky stuff is like, no, all right, we got to make sure whenever the Celtics go to Charlotte, it's both times are on a Monday night. And that first Monday he had like 30 points in the first half. And then the Celtics completely fell apart. So he didn't look good. He, ha- he, he has needs this for uh redemption Monday night. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is the first time them seeing uh, Grant Williams on the Hornets. So I think he's just annoying enough. That I'm expecting a good Jason Tatum performance. Bad locker room guy, most annoying teammate ever. That's what that's what, that's what the streets are saying. <laughs> that's right. I just want to see Tatum ISO Grant like 18 times that game. <laughs> just, just like clear out. We're just gonna pick on Grant all game. And I love Grant. I don't. I I, I think Grant's got a bad rap. I, I I enjoyed his time with the Celtics. I know he talks a lot, but like I don't know. I still think he was cool. Whatever. Sue me. All right, well, make sure you check out uh, Handsome Be Wonderful over here, Sam Packard on <laughs> Twitter, at Jam Packard. Uh, also, uh, the Still Potable uh, account has, uh, they've, they've got a Twitter account. They're heads and shoulders above us. We we're, we don't have a, a Celtics Beat Twitter account. We just ask that you follow us. But at Still Potable is uh, where you can find that as well. Daily Celtics Podcast. Make sure you check that out with Sam, with J. King, with uh, B. Rob, Brian Rob. We love having those guys on this show. But uh, Sam, it's a great pleasure, man. We really enjoyed it. We'll have to do it again. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me on. Fun, fun to talk to you. Absolutely. All right, guys. Uh, let, let's hope the Celtics you know, continue to win games, that it's uh, maybe some more inspiring wins than what we've seen of late. And uh, again, most importantly, uh, even if you lose the final eight, just be healthy. Just be healthy. Be healthy come April 15th, tax day, and then the playoffs begin. Let's get on with it. So uh, for Sam, for Evan, I am Adam. Check us out, uh, Celtics Beat, wherever you get your podcast, rate, review, most importantly, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you again next week.